Another relationship that I want to talk about is the idea of symbiosis. Symbiosis is a really long-term relationship that exists between two members of different species. And the relationship is so strong that at times it is impossible to separate the two. The two. Or at least one of them must rely on the other for survival. And in most cases it is an indication of a really close-knit relationship where evolution must have taken place with them together because the physiology and behaviors of these animals are matched or they are in competition to one to try to trying to avoid the other in the case of parasitism but it has a really close evolutionary physiological behavior relationship regardless of which kind of symbiosis you're talking about but there are three kinds of symbiosis and we'll talk about each one of them at a time the first kind of symbiosis is when both animals benefit from each other and that's called mutualism so mutualism is when one helps the other right so let's look at the examples the bird that lives on top of a deer for example he eats off the deer so the parasites that are living the beer like things like you know fleas and things like that Meanwhile, the deer gets free of the parasites and the bird gets its food, so they're both helping each other out. The sea anemone and the clown, same, similar concept. The clownfish clears the debris in the sea anemone so that it, the sea anemone doesn't get sick. And meanwhile, the, the, the clown gets the protection and the food from the sea anemone. So it's a mutualistic relationship. We also talked about before about the idea that some plants live in symbiotic relationships with fungus. So that's called mycorrhizae. The roots of the plants rely on the fungus for the nutrients and the fungus relies on the roots of the plants for their sugar. So they live together. Likewise, lichen, a good example of uh, another mutualistic relationship between a fungus and an algae. Same thing as the mycorrhizae in the plants. You no, know, one gets the sugar and the other one gets the nutrients and they live together. The same thing the bird and the alligator the a bird goes inside the alligator's mouth and cleans the alligator's teeth and the alligator permits that because it's protecting him meanwhile the bird gets food the cleaner shrimp the cleaner shrimp that gets the food off cleaning the fish which then gets blast sick because of it and the classic example of insects that live off getting things in the flowers like nectar or pollen and they help the, the, the and sending the pollen from one plant to another which helps the reproduction process of the flowers another important one is bacterial symbiosis and it happens a lot in life an example of that is the herbivores that eat grass a majority of them cannot digest the cellulose which is the chemicals inside the the grass that actually contain the sugars that they need to survive so they have to have in their intestines bacteria that help them do that. So they live in a symbiotic relationship. The bacteria gets food after that, and then the, the, the herbivore will also get food off because of those bacteria that live in their intestines. We also have similar bacteria living in our intestines, but they don't necessarily do that. They just live there, living, eating off the detritus of the food that doesn't get processed by us. But it, they're actually helping us, though, because if they weren't there, other, more toxic bacteria could take their place. So because they're there, they, they're competing with the bacteria that could hurt us. So in a way, they're helping us. Even though they're infecting us, they're not really parasites because they're not really hurting us. They're just eating the stuff that we wouldn't use anyways. And at the same time, they're protecting us by their mere presence in competition from other worse bacteria. So they are called enteric bacteria that live in our intestines and actually protects us from other bacteria that could possibly hurt us. All of these are examples of mutant mutualism then you also have commensalism this is a little more tricky to spot but that's when the one relationship is positive for one of the organisms and for the other organism is neutral and either helps them or hurts them examples of this are the fish that the smaller fish that swims close to larger fish you know the larger fish doesn't care to eat them anyways so because it's not their prey it's not what they eat but because they're close to that big fish the smaller fish doesn't get eaten by other things. So it's not really helping the big fish. But the smaller fish gets the protection of the big fish. And so the smaller fish is being helped. Another example is the barnacles that grow on whales. It's literally a type of mollusk that lives attached to the whale. Now, the whale doesn't actually get hurt by that. It's just, you know, there. It doesn't actually affect anything for the whale. And you see this, the spots on the, on the flipper of the whale there. Those are the barnacles. Now, these barnacles don't hurt the whale, but the barnacles get helped because as the whale swims through the water, the water goes through the barnacles and they filter the nutrients that they need off the water. So it's helping the barnacles without helping or hurting the whale. So that's called commensalism. All right? The last type is a famous one. You've heard about it. It's called 
parasitism. Now, parasitism is when one gets helped while the other one gets hurt. Now, most parasites don't actually kill their hosts, so it's not really predation. But they actually infect their hosts and steal from their hosts, and that means they're hurting their hosts as they're getting their help. Several examples of that are mosquitoes that suck up the blood of, of other organisms, uh, plants which eat fungus as to get the nutrients of the fungus, those parasitic plants which trap insects, the carnivorous plants are another example of that. Look at the parasites growing in the caterpillar, for example. You have bacteria, lots of different bacteria are examples of parasites. There's, you have protozoa like malaria that's carried by a mosquito that goes in the bloodstream and it's a parasite inside of the red blood cells and causes disease inside humans. You have uh, intestinal parasites, heartworms, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, parasites that you've heard, of, uh, probably heard about that live inside animals. And there's some other kinds of interesting parasitism that's not really one eating off the other, but it's like stealing energy from the other. For example, the cuckoo uh, bird, instead of laying eggs in its own nest and taking care of its own eggs, he puts his eggs in the middle of another bird's nest. And then when the eggs hatch, uh, the bird will take care of the cuckoo's babies as well as their babies. And in fact, more often than not, the cuckoo steals food from the babies of, of the other kind. So that what ends up happening is that the parent doesn't even really realize that what's happening is that he's being cheated and taking care of an animal that's not even his. It's not his DNA that's getting passed on to future generations. This is an example of parasitism. By the way, parasites which go inside of its host are called endoparasites, or and that's endoparasitism, like the malaria that we talked about. But parasites that are live outside of the host are called ectoparasites, or ectoparasitism. Endoparasites, by the way, are among the most common organisms on Earth, when you start to consider the fact that the most common organisms are unicellular prokaryotic bacteria that lives every single place on Earth. And even those among those larger organisms are also going to be endoparasites. But in general, parasites constitute almost a third of the known species that live in the planet. So it's definitely very important. It's a very good way to survive. Because you see, if two organisms are competing for the same niche, and we'll talk about that, what that means in a second, one thing that you can do to avoid having problems is to become a parasite of the other one. And that's kind of how this develops, the theory is. But of course, in order for this to develop, you would have to evolve to not kill the host. Because if the parasite kills the host, he dies himself. Because remember, he relies on the host for survival. These are very interesting relationships because of that. All right, that's symbiotic relationships. And remember, what all symbiotic relationships have in common is the idea that both are so intrinsically connected that they exist in tandem with each other, right? One cannot really uh, exist without the other. Like in the case of parasites, they don't exist without the host. In the case of commensalism, they need the, the one that's helping them out to live. And in the case of mutualism, they both need each other in order to survive.